um, you know, refreshment before the talk. Um, and I don't know whether you know this or not, but you can immediately skip uh, the, uh, let me see, I need to see how I can go to the next slide, just one sec, guys. So you can immediately go to the website of the Clay Institute for Mathematics. Uh, and then you go to the tab uh, on the Millennium Problems. And then in this tab, you would actually discover the uh, suggested unsolved problem of the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, so you can read the preview and uh, there is a statement that although these equations were written down in 19th century, our understanding of them remains minimal. Uh, and the challenge is to take a substantial progress towards a mathematical theory, which will unlock the secrets hidden in the Navier-Stokes equation. So I think this just reassures that we as a community solving the correct equations, or at least uh, trying to work on the topical uh, problems. Uh, probably, as you know, for uh, this Millennium problems, there is uh, a prize. Uh, and uh, so uh, feel free to give it a try. So. I was curious enough to actually check the formulation of the problem. So you can click on this link uh, and uh, read the problem for yourself. I have an open uh, rules. Uh, so you don't submit anything to them. Uh, you need to uh, publicly publish your solutions to Navier Stokes equations. So let's have a deal that, um, uh, so there are three, three basic things you need to do. So publish the solution in qualified outlet uh, at least two years must be passed since the publication uh, and the proposed solution must be received general acceptance in the global. So I would say physics community is probably the more appropriate uh, reassurance. So you can send it to me, I'll approve it. And uh, so if we win, we just share the prize. Uh, so then I just, so the problem itself uh, is formulated. You can imagine this is mathematicians, right? So the problem is formulated in five pages. Uh, you can read this document. Uh, so I just copy pasted the opening uh, about the, so the problem is about the existence and smoothness of Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, and okay, lots of symbols. So enjoy it, just check it out. Um, just to understand how sometimes mathematicians thinks about uh, physics problems. Uh, but this is something I wanted to share with you as a little. And so this is not, <laughs> not a joke, this is a, a uh, true problem to solve and true things to, uh, you know, to consider, to think about. All right, uh, so that's a preview. We actually with Lars just felt to keep it light and just wanted to entertain you a little bit with the fake uh, title and the um, abstract of the talk. So what I really want to talk about today is about the uh, aerodynamic description of transport in strongly correlated to the systems. I prepared uh, two uh, main uh, topics. So I prepared more than it's probably possible to cover in one hour. My real goal is to um, uh, my real goal is to cover uh, one and two for you. So strongly correlated two D hole and two D electron systems. Uh, the topic itself is quite old, um, and this system's been studied for many years. Uh, but I would like to provide um, a kind of more a present perspective, uh, I would say, into some of the transport properties on the systems. Uh, and then I'd like to talk about the extensions of the first talk on strongly correlated double layers. So I'll speak a bit about the cool and drag and some other things related in the transport and by layers. Again, at the hierodynamic regime, I'd like to say a few things about the collective modes. Uh, and some, uh, some topics of whole viscosity and some other related topics. And then uh, if I somehow will go fast and there will be a little bit time left, I prepared two kind of highlights. I didn't go too much into details and some other topics that I worked on recently about hydrodynamic description of non-fermi liquids. Uh, I have something to say yeah, about ideas of hydro description for the Huffield Landau level and some recent work um, on transport near the neutrality point. Again, it's a uh, problem inspired by experiments. Uh, people worked on it, but we had some uh, results that uh, differ from previous ones. So I might highlight uh, you know, points of convergence and uh, points of divergence. So that, that's planned for today. Uh, every um, topic would uh, include some experimental motivation. 
These two are, as I said, they're pretty old and I kind of selected some results that go back uh, in time, uh, but I hope you may like it. So it will be different from, you know, most recent talks on uh, hydro and graphene. One thing, uh, one thing is that I don't see you guys. I just took um, screen. So if you ask, just, just go ahead and ask questions. Uh, I just don't see your faces, um, so it's a little difficult to judge whether I go quick or not. Just, you know, interrupt me, please, with any questions you may have for me. All right, uh, so let me see. Uh, uh, sorry, for some reason it... Sorry, just one sec. For some reason, it stopped uh, moving. Sorry, do do you um, do you see my screen? Uh, yes, hmm. but the Sorry, slide is not changing. Just, yeah, I just stuck on. Um, gosh, just one second. Let me. Just one sec. Let me redo it. I'm sorry for this technical issue. Let me try it again. Um, uh, Slide is back. I'm just not understanding why it refuses to move from Um, page to page. This is really strange to me. Just one second, guys. I, I'm just, I, I really apologize for. <clears throat> so let me, let me maybe try like a different file. So I just prepared also like a PDF, maybe a PDF would cooperate better. Um, uh, just one second. So let me see here again. I'm sorry for try more time. Do you see now the screen again? Um, yeah, I mean, I see the, the PDF, the, the, the Adobe. Yes, okay, let's maybe try this one. Um, all right. Um, at least it's moving. So the part one is, um, about the strongly correlated 2D systems, uh, the story itself about the viscous magnetic resistance. Uh, the theory part, uh, we kind of worked uh, together with my former postdoc, Hongi, uh, and uh, kind of inspired by discussions with Anton. And experimentally, there is an ongoing effort uh, with Juan Gao from Case Western, and Juan actually provided lots of, uh, you know, early motivation and early experiments, so I'll show some of the results from his old work uh, and from some of the more uh, recent work as well. So, uh, so when we talk about the quantum wells and gallium arsenide, we um, often talk about interaction parameter, which is a typical ratio between the coolant energy and um, uh, kinetic energy. Uh, and if we tailor this to a two-dimensional system, the RS parameter is inversely proportional to the square root of density. So we can enhance the interparticle interactions by going to system with lower uh, with lower density. And what is exper experimentally achievable uh, is that to be in the density regime when effective en Fermi energy becomes in the range uh, or even smaller than one Kelvin. So it's very, very distinct and very different from, let's say, the regimes of transport that is achievable in, uh, let's say, graphene samples right now. So we will be exploring different temperature domain in different regimes in terms of the strength of interparticle interactions. So it is possible to get to RS um, in a wide range, let's say uh, as big as up to, let's say 40. So it's, it's a serious parameter to take into the considerations. Uh, and again, the temperature can be either smaller than the Fermi energy or larger than the Fermi energy so that we can cross over to the non-degenerate regime, but still regime of semi-quantum uh, fluid with strong interparticle interactions. 
Uh, so the model that I would uh, use to describe transport is, uh, so I'll assume that uh, these samples are clean enough and yeah, sure enough they have very good mobility, but still there is some amount of disorder present. And the type of the disorder that I'd like to think about for uh, this talk are the uh, long range um, in homogeneity potential. So this electrons or holes can flow in the hills and valleys of, of some random potential. And uh, so we will uh, try to apply ideas of heterodynamics to describe the strongly correlated uh, uh, regime. Now, uh, of course, we know that if we go with RS too high, uh, this electron system would eventually crystallize. And so we'll get into regime of Wigner crystal. So there's been known for a very long time. And I think in terms of kind of inspiration and in thinking about the system, Boris Pivak and Steve Kivelson uh, thought about, um, uh, you know, what happens actually in between. So what happens in between the Fermi liquid description at the higher densities and uh, Wigner crystal description at lower densities. And they proposed uh, a number of intermediate phases. They called them, uh, termed them uh, microemulsion phases. Uh, in this phase diagram. And this uh, qualitative picture that they developed in a series of those works uh, has also confirmation by very serious uh, numerical studies and Monte Carlo studies and studies of the phase diagram. So in this plot, I'm here uh, showing uh, so temperature. And sorry, the, I apologize, the uh, lower part of the plot is cut a little bit. Uh, it's inverse RS. So greater the RS or the smaller, smaller a uh, stronger interaction is actually a smaller uh, number on the x-axis. So they do find different uh, crystalline ordering of this crystal uh, in, the, in some intermediate phases. And for us, the discussion would be, of course, we will not ask ourselves about the microscopics of the state, um, but we will try to think about the strongly correlated 2D liquids, thinking that RS is large, meaning that larger than one, but still, of course, smaller, then the critical value of the parameter when system crystallizes. So we, of course, like to be in the liquid regime. And uh, so this is kind of the scale of energy um, uh, energy variable. So we have Fermi energy, we have a uh, plasma frequency, we have the scale of interparticle interactions. And we, if we allow ourselves RS as a, a physical parameter in the problem, they're well spaced um, from each other. And we could think about the temperature scale and being in different regimes. So in early days, I would say prior to 2010 and you know decade, decade prior to that, people primarily studied the systems from the perspective of the metal uh, and insulator transition. So it is very known, very well known that as a function of carrier density, uh, once you change uh, particle concentration and thus you change interaction parameter in this broad range, let's say from 20 to 40, some of the samples have metallic-like behavior in their transport properties in the low temperature regime. Some of them have this intermediate range and some of them go insulating. So I would say that early um, uh, and most of the prior studies have been focused on the metal insulator uh, physics. Um, so what I would like to do in this talk is to concentrate on this lower corner of the lower temperature, a um, lower corner of metallic uh, regime and look at the transport properties of the systems. And even though in early days, uh, people didn't thought so much about the hydrodynamics, I would like to try to provide, again, some, uh, some ideas maybe also using uh, inspiration uh, from the uh, works of other people that I will highlight uh, to think about ideas of hydrodynamics in an attempt uh, to describe um, uh, resistivity and drug resistivity in the samples. So what I've done here is that in the review uh, from uh, Boris and Steve and Sergey and Juan, uh, in one of the opening uh, sections, you will see that they collected a resistivity. So here I, I took like four, uh, four plots showing you resistivity as a function of temperature in the samples. And these are very uh, measurements from different groups on different samples. Uh, some of them are representing 2D holes and let's say silicon germanium quantum wells. Other plots represent 2D uh, electrons in silicate MOSFET or gallium arsenide quantum wells and so on. But you see that they share some of the same features. So at the very low temperature, there is this rise of resistivity. Again, I wouldn't much speculate about whether it's linear anti-resistivity or not. 
uh, but it uh, looks pretty linear by i. It reaches a maximum, uh, and then it drops. Um, and in some samples, if you go higher in temperature, there is the shallow minimum and then upturn in the temperature dependence. Okay, so the idea and some some kind of idea that I'd like to propose maybe is that this this trend after the maximum, meaning the downturn of the resistivity and the shallow minimum upturn is perhaps can be understood purely at the electronic level. And so kind of manifestation of the Gurji effect uh, in the, um, uh, and the kind of aerodynamics idea. So this is one of the things that I'd like to talk to you today. And so Juan also uh, in his measurements uh, tried to put some numbers on the effects of let's say electron form and scattering. And uh, uh, so this line, the green line in the um, upper right plot uh, shows the estimate for the deformation potential on gallium quantum well. So you basically cannot, uh, in this temperature range, cannot explain the trend and the behavior of resistivity in walking electron form and scattering. So let's try to think about just purely electronic mechanisms. All right, so um, so what I started here was just, uh, again, so inspiration from this work from Anton and Steve and Boris. Um, I kind of learned about this work firsthand uh, because Anton was spending uh, part of his sabbatical in Argon lab and I was a postdoc there around the same time. So he kind of shared ideas and just basically educated me about the topic itself. I will not spend much time about motivating hydro and explaining when it works or not. Uh, in this series, we had lots of talks already. I just basically say that aerodynamics ideas are powerful enough and they describe most of the liquids in the long um, uh, uh, land scales longer than the intrinsic mean three paths. In old days, it was really relevant because of disorder primarily in the sample imperfection. So we typically use kinetic equation to describe transport. But in high mobility samples, low density carriers and the proper temperature regime, uh, when the uh, electron electron mean three pass becomes small um, uh, than the typical length scales at which uh, momentum relaxation occurs. So we can try to think about the uh, microscopic aerodynamic description. And these uh, ideas would be extremely useful uh, specifically for this regime of large RS where we basically don't have any microscopic tools. I mean, there is no kinetic equation really. We could not really do any perturbative like calculations that, um, I mean, we, we do in some other circumstances. And um, so Radi Gurji put this uh, ideas early on in 1968. Uh, it is also kind of uh, a personal connection. So he worked at the Low Temperature Institute in Kharkov, and uh, so I was I was studying there, and my apartment was uh, two bus stops away from the institute, and we often had lectures from different members uh, of the uh, institute group. So it, it is nice to see that some of his ideas back in the day, right now, are uh, getting new uh, new life, and uh, it's it's nice to see. And so this plot in the right is a similar. Um, looking plot for the resistance uh, as a function of temperature that he put forward a uh, long time, long time ago. All right, so what I would like to do as a first step is to guide you through the little calculation that Anton uh, and Steve and Boris did. It is very simple, but it will set a stage for our analysis and comparison when I will get back to the uh, back, get to the discussion of let's say transport and bilayers. Uh, so, so let's let's look at the Navier-Stokes equation in a steady uh, steady state setup. We will assume that there are some long range inhomogeneity, which I'm trying to highlight here, and the dots representing electrons that are floating uh, and experiencing this landscape uh, of the random potential. And so, basically, we would like to calculate uh, the resistivity, and there are several ways to do it. Uh, I'll do it in a way that uh, kind of Anton suggested by the entropy production uh, in the flow of the liquid and uh, equating that to the joule heat production in, in the flow. So the entropy production uh, in the hydrodynamics uh, comprises of the two contributions uh, related to the viscous stresses. This is second term uh, in the entropy production formula in the heat fluxes um, induced during the, during the flow. So I will do uh, a calculation in 1D setting. Uh, and in the next slide, I'll highlight the 2D. Uh, so 1D is very, very simple, but uh, intuitive. And I think it's really nice um, 
kind of see how the calculations works out. So in 1D, if we look um, just at the uh, continuity equation, uh, we see that the aerodynamic flow velocity, which is a uh, coordinate dependent, of course, because the flow occurs at the length scale of the random potential times the particle density is constant. So, um, so it means that we have a relationship between coordinate dependent hydro velocity and coordinate dependent uh, density of particles. Now from here, we can calculate um, the stress tensor. So in 1D case, there is only bulk viscosity. So we need to concentrate only in the second term, which contains a divergence uh, of the velocity field. So we get the stress tensor is the bulk viscosity current and the divergence of the inverse density. And from here, we can go back now to the entropy production equation and to calculate that. So we take this um, uh, stress tensor and again, multiply by the divergence uh, of the velocity field. So we get J squared, which will cancel uh, the same J squared in the Joule heating formula. We have square of the gradient of the inverse density averaged over the disorder potential and the bulk viscosity. So that's first part of the formula that tells us that uh, resistivity is proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. And there is a second part that uh, works out basically in a similar fashion uh, through the second part of the Navier Stokes uh, sequence in the entropy production equation. And we just need to concentrate uh, thermal fluxes that will give us uh, a, a second part of the resistivity, which is uh, inversely proportional to the thermal conductivity of the fluid and the square of the uh, entropy density per particle variation in, in the sample. So that's, that's the formula in 1D. I'd like to tell you that it has quite deep connection, for instance, to 1D fluids, and you can think about uh, extended description of the Lattinger liquid theory and try to understand the equilibration processes that give rise to equilibration in 1D in the model, which is beyond the linearized, uh, let's say, Lattinger description. Uh, and you can, uh, in some models, to calculate what the thermal conductivities and viscosities would be. So it, it kind of branches out to a different uh, direction of the strongly correlated fluids, but let's say in, in 1D setting. Okay, in two dimensions, the formula basically remains the same. There is a factor of two in denominator um, uh, up front uh, near the square the uh, charge of an electron. And then bulk viscosity needs to be substituted by the sum of the bulks and shear. But other than that, the structure of the formula remains the same. Uh, so um, I uh, so this is um, basically in their paper, and we will uh, analyze um, emerging temperature dependence um, of this result. Of course, in applications to strongly correlated liquids, we don't really have means to calculate temperature dependence of thermal conductivity and viscosity. Uh, but I will rely on some other experimental facts of trying to infer some predictive uh, statements from this formula. Of course, once again, all of this microscopic details of interparticle interactions are buried inside of this pristine kinetic coefficients of the, of the fluid. So uh, I worked out uh, an extension of this to 2D flow in the external magnetic field in classically strong fields. And uh, it's a very similar calculation. Uh, we just need to do a little more careful projection on longitudinal and transversal components of the current uh, flow. Uh, and we can derive a very similar result for resistivity that contains, again, the piece, which is thermal conductivity, uh, yeah, inverse proportionality to thermal conductivity, viscosity, and also magnetic resistance. So quadratic positive magnetic resistance uh, that scales inversely proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. So I should say, of course, that there are several mechanisms that, uh, how magnet resistance can occur. So for instance, you can get a mechanism of magnet resistance by the fact that viscosity itself is field dependent. Uh, this, I believe, was discussed um, in recent years uh, by Alexei. If I should have put uh, a reference here. So, um, uh, but this mechanism of magnet resistance, which by the way gives negative um, uh, magnet resistance in this model is subdominant. So basically you could estimate the relationship by taking magnetic field dependent piece of the viscosity and then compare this to this uh, Lorentz force induced magnet resistance in the presence of the random long range potential and the ratio between them uh, can be written as the intrinsic mean three path 
uh, over the correlation radius of the disorder potential uh, to the power of four. And at least in the regime when mean three path is small, and this is where we would like to be uh, for the hydrodynamic description to be applicable uh, in the um, uh, long range disorder potential so that uh, 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 this parameter is small. So this mechanism kind of dominates. So we, we think that uh, at least in this setting, uh, we should see a positive magnet resistance. And uh, maybe it's nice to highlight that if it is possible to study the temperature dependence of the pre-factor in magnetic resistance near B square term, it, this gives access to a possible measurement of the temperature dependence of the viscosity of the fluid. And I will highlight this attempt from the uh, measurements uh, done by Huang Gao from Case Western just a couple of slides from here. All right, so this Alex, is- can I ask a yeah. question? Yes. Uh, you don't seem to have whole viscosity here. Not, not here, yes. I will include it later on. Uh, this, again, it's, is a subdominant uh, uh, contribution to the main term, but I will include it later on. Uh, and will to tell you how, how uh, it modifies the description of the fluid okay. uh, transport. Uh, it, it will follow in, the, in a drug context and when I will talk about the collective modes, but it, it applies here as well. So I, I will make a reference um, to this point, uh, maybe in 10, 15 minutes from, from now. So now what I would like to do is to analyze the temperature dependence and it's, extract some state, uh, extract some uh, kind of predictive statements. And as I said, we have no reference point really. So it, it, at RS, which is let's say 25, uh, there is not much that we can calculate. So what um, I will speculate um, is the following. I'd like to rely on the work done by Jim Eisenstein uh, when he studied uh, quasi-particle lifetimes uh, in, of 2D holes uh, in the Galio Marcinet quantum wells. And his experiments been carried out uh, at RS up to 10, let's say 10, 11. So it's big enough, let, let, let's put it this way. And uh, at least experimentally, he made a statement that at least when we talk about temperature dependence, not the order of magnitude of the estimate, for the lifetime of in the Fermi liquid description, but let's say just the general trend of the temperature dependence, he said that they're consistent with the Fermi liquid like uh, power law. So lifetime is square inverse uh, tau uh, EE or whole whole would be T square. So what I would like to do is take these formulas and let, let's pretend that even in this high, high RS regime, at least the temperature dependence is the one that we expect in Fermi liquids. And, uh, and let's see at least by the parametric estimate without any, uh, of course, numbers and some attempts in quantitative description, but let's see qualitatively what kind of temperature dependence we will get. And so this is what I'd like to do here. So uh, to be concrete, I'd like to use, to do this uh, long range uh, disorder potential averaging. I'd like to consider this doping layer, which is a reasonable model for this quantum wells. Uh, so uncorrelated dopants that are screened and producing random potential, so coulomb like disorder. So co correlation radius in this model would be a distance D uh, to the two deck uh, from this doping layer. So this would be my correlation radius. And so this formula will simply allow us to do um, disorder averaging. And then, so we estimate thermal conductivity for the Fermi liquid, uh, so which is in gas kinetic formula is mean free path times the specific heat. So mean free pass would be one over T square and the specific heat would be linear in T. So roughly speaking, uh, we expect thermal conductivity to scale inversely uh, with temperature. And again, a disclaimer here, of course, in 2D, in weak, uh, weakly correlated regime, we, we can calculate thermal conductivity from Boltzmann equation. And there we do know it's not simply one over T, there are some logs there and there are some logs and viscosity, but these details right now beyond what I'm able to say. I mean, I could not even pretend that Boltzmann would work, uh, let's say in, in this regime of strongly correlated uh, system. So I'm suppressing all of the extra high level science here about some logarithmic correction. So we're just going after the bulk leading uh, temperature dependence um, right here. So, so just to say that I'm not boldly I'm missing something, but I purposely am missing because this is probably beyond the regime of uh, 
you know, accuracy of these estimates. So, uh, so when hydro regime is expected to work here, so the condition that I'd like to do is that this uh, uh, correlation radius of disorder potential should be larger than the mean free path. And if we estimate the mean free path uh, in the Fermi liquid picture, it gives us a condition that temperature should be larger than Fermi energy divided by square root of K Fermi D. So for these samples, and again, D is, is the distance between the doping layer and the uh, two deck. So if you estimate K Fermi D for the typical densities when this RS is 10 or 25, this parameter ranges somewhere between 2 to 16. Again, it, it is a density dependent, uh, but I will keep it in my estimation as sort of a large parameter. So at least let's say 10 or eight uh, to have a clear separation between the length scales. All right, so that's that. So uh, basically this condition gave me T1 and this T1 in this uh, is the onset of the hydro regime. So I would like to think that everywhere at temperatures above T1 is something that we could uh, think that hydrodynamic regime should be applicable. This other scale T2 is estimation where this shallow minimum should occur. So basically what I'm trying to write in this formula in the red box, the first term, which is T to the power four is the term of the thermal conductivity. So if I go back to the previous slide, uh, to explain you the temperature dependence. As you can see, we have T up front, then we have entropy per particle squared. So entropy per par entropy is linear in temperature and Fermi liquid. So entropy per particle is square. So numerator is T cube. And then thermal conductivity is one over T. So it's another power of temperature. So this is T to the power four in numerator. And this average over the random potential will give us a proper factor of K Fermi D. And the second term, which is viscosity, it will simply give us one over the T square. So these are two terms in this formula that I'm highlighting to you. And if you uh, compare them together, you will see that uh, originally viscosity dominates and it leads to this uh, downturn in the temperature dependence, like in Gurji effect. So D, D, negative differential thermal resistance. Uh, and then there is uh, a term where they would compare basically, and then the thermal conductivity would uh, overtake and, and go up into some regime. So what I'm trying to say is that this downturn up term is perhaps uh, can be explained in purely electronic uh, fashion through this uh, hydrodynamic picture that uh, Boris and uh, Anton and uh, Steve proposed. And this was basically an analysis uh, of their expressions. And um, again, at least in the Fermi liquid picture, the pre-factor of the magnetic resistance should follow T square um, uh, dependence. Again, if we believe that uh, Fermi liquid is right uh, and temperature dependences uh, specific to the Fermi liquid are the right uh, ingredients uh, for, for uh, experiments. Uh, so that's that. And uh, to conclude the story, I'd like to highlight um, recent, very recent result from Juan Gao. And I'm thankful for Juan to allow me to do that. Uh, uh, this is unpublished. So he actually tried to measure magnetic resistance in of the 2D holes in large RS. And he sees very, very complex uh, behavior uh, in magnetic resistance. So the uh, so zero field resistivity is very similar as you can see in this metallic side of uh, metal to insulator transition. It's again, um, a sharp rise of resistivity, a maximum in this downturn, uh, but magnetic resistance is peculiar in low temperature regime. So in, for his samples, Fermi energy is roughly speaking uh, near one Kelvin. In estimation, we believe that this idea of so hydro description may work somewhere above, let's say, half of the Kelvin. And what he sees is that in the low temperature side, magnetic resistance is actually negative. Uh, so this is in the lower panel, uh, panel B, uh, panel A, excuse me. But once you start to raise your temperature, you all overcome about half of a Kelvin, you start to developing this shallow uh, kind of minimum, and then it progresses, progresses more once you go to the higher temperature and you see a development of the positive magnetic resistance. Now, if you allow yourself to think that this hydro description works, you can try to analyze the temperature dependence uh, of this uh, parabolic shape and try to extract um, the viscosity based on the picture that I provided you in the previous slide. 
Um, uh, so the dot points are the data extracted from this analysis. The dashed lines are just guide to the eye and attempt to fit to uh, either one of the T square or one of the T behavior of the viscosity. And one over the T is something very specific that was proposed uh, again by uh, uh, Boris Pivak and Steve Kivelson and expected temperature dependence of viscosity in the semi-quantum regime. Uh, I think Boris used some ideas from early days of studies of helium-4 and some other correlated liquids. So it's not really a calculation, it's more like heuristic argument. Uh, but uh, again, so we, we put the two lines, just a guide to the eye and, and say that if we try to extract viscosity in this measurement, it is very sensitive to density range and it, it changes, uh, changes strongly in this, uh, in this uh, domain um, of measurements. All right, so this is analysis uh, of uh, vis uh, viscous magnetic resistance in 2D. And um, I'd like to move on to elaborate on these ideas now for bilayers. And again, pl please keep in mind this formula for the resistivity of a single layer system, one term that is inversely proportional to thermal conductivity and second term that is linear in viscosity. Quite remarkably, we will see that in certain regime, also in hydrodynamic regime applicable to bilayers, uh, the drug resistivity in the samples uh, uh, can take, will take a very similar form. So there is some uh, underlying physics that connects both of them. And this is something that I would like to explain you as well. So the second part is about the strongly correlated uh, electronic double layers. So this work was done with my former postdoc Stas uh, Apostolov and the recent work was Dima Pessin and uh, University of Virginia. So with Dima we've done Magneta uh, related part and Wei Chen really helped us to figure out some very delicate crossover regime which is neither ballistic nor hydrodynamic and I will say a few things about this as well. So we wrote um, uh, an article with Boris uh, a few years ago about the coolant drug. So if you're interested, please check it out. We really have tried. Um, so I'll give you a very, very quick uh, summary of experiments that will be relevant for me. I mean, it's impossible to cover the whole field, uh, but uh, so coolant drug is uh, two circuits, two conducting circuits which are electrically isolated, but they're coupled uh, interactively. Um, uh, by uh, let's say interwire or interlayer electron electron scattering, we drive uh, one of the currents uh, in one of the circuits, the drive current, and measure non local voltage in the other one and define the quantity which is a non local drug resistance. And this non local drug resistance is typically studied as a function of density in each of the layers, density mismatch, temperature distance between the layers, magnetic field that can be applied in plane or out of plane and so on and so forth. So I will, again, mostly concentrate on very, very old uh, results. And I'd like to do it for the purpose. I, again, would like to look at some of these regimes of strongly correlated liquids and highlight some features of coolant drug physics, which was not probably looked at or maybe appreciated enough in um, old days. and. Uh, uh, now, from the perspective of aerodynamics, it may be interesting to revise our understanding and thinking of the systems. So I'll, very, I'll just give you in maybe five to 10 minutes quick um, overview of some experiments that I would like to discuss specifically and highlight few features that are in the data. So the first uh, experimental realization, or maybe one of the first, was done by um, Kramala, Jim Eisenstein, and Alan McDonald worked out some calculation in, in this famous paper that I'm sure many of you know. So they measured, um, I believe this was gallium arsenide quantum wells, and these are typical uh, dimensions for this quantum wells. The thickness of about 200 angstroms, uh, distance between them uh, more or less in the same range. Particle density was high enough so that if you estimate RS for the systems, they are weakly correlated. So RS is of the order of one. Uh, modest mobility. And so Alan, uh, I think, calculated some of the uh, scattering time. So basically, the drug resistance uh, can be written down almost like in the fashion of the Druda formula, with the difference that the tau that enters is the uh, tau from electron electric scattering time. And so uh, quadratic uh, temperature dependence. 
But uh, so one thing uh, for the sake of the discussion, so pay, pay attention to the scale of drug resistance. These are milliohms per square when RS is one. I will come back to numbers uh, a little bit later in a few slides from now. Second thing that I would like to highlight, which people didn't pay very close attention, but in the second or third page of this experiment, they basically took their resistance and replotted it slightly differently. They basically replotted drug resistance normalized by T square. So this is in this second part that I'm highlighting in the red box. And as you can see, uh, I mean, okay, so theoretically you would expect to, to have a flat line. Uh, so just a plateau, which is a constant, but they do that their data suggest actually temperature dependence. And this temperature dependence is different for different layer separation. Um, um, I will give you reasons uh, to believe that the upturn, this uh, point, inflection point at which uh, there is a downturn, so sub T square temperature dependence should shift. So this point should shift to the lower temperature side once you make samples with bigger layer separation. And I will give you um, what I think this temperature scale is. And for the sake of this discussion, let's introduce temperature scale, which I will call T with a subscript D. Okay, so I will explain from where this come from and what should be expected for the temperature dependence in this, uh, in this regime. Uh, so now a few years after that, uh, many other groups uh, continue to measure drug at higher temperature regime. And primarily these groups from uh, uh, England, from Britain, they wanted to study the physics of plasmons and plasmon resonance in the bilayers. So uh, again, uh, this plot here um, um, is drug resistance divided by T square. So I'm very sorry that the quality of this uh, axis is not very clear to you, but I'm just saying that this is exactly the same units as in this box, uh, in red box that I highlighted. So think of this line uh, at lowest temperature as a continuation of what Jim uh, measured in early days. So it's just an extension of the drug resistance to a higher temperature. So as you see this downfall, but then this downfall of resistance reaches yet another seemingly crossover scale, uh, which I abbreviate as TC. And then it starts growing, growing up. So it is uh, starting to grow as a function of temperature, meaning the temperature dependence is higher than T square it reaches yet another local maximum, and then it starts dying out yet at higher temperature. So again, for the sake of this discussion, let me introduce two more scales. I will call it TC and TH, and I will give them precise definitions, and I will try to tell you what's physically happening uh, at those crossover scales and what happens uh, with drug and which mechanism dominates what. So this is my intent to try to explain these uh, data points. So uh, now similar measurements, but in the strongly correlated regime. This was done by uh, Pilarisetti and Emmanuel Tituk and Shaigan uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, so these are very similar quantum wells in terms of their dimensions, but what is very different is mobility. They're much cleaner and also the density range. Uh, they are in the regime when RS per layer is somewhere from 10 to 30. Uh, what happens is that if you look now at the scale of the absolute magnitude of the drug, it's already not, it's in the scale of kilo ohms. So it's a very strongly enhanced regime. And when they've tried to measure temperature dependence, they fail to match it to the predictions of the Fermi liquid regime in terms of the temperature dependences. And if you read their paper, they even try to make a statement that maybe this is not a Fermi liquid like regime and we need to rethink. Uh, what is happening. So I think um, Fermi liquid can still uh, give an explanation and the fact that they could not fit the data is just because there are this different temperature regimes in different crossovers. So it's not a single power law that works, but actually a combination of different, um, uh, different physical effects that we will discuss with you. So that's that. Um, another thing that I'd like to highlight, so two more things that I'd like to highlight from the data. Again, they measured magneto drug. Now there are two different kinds of magneto drugs they measured. They measured one of them in the in-plane field. And here I'd like to highlight quite a uh, uh, surprising feature that the behavior of the in-plane single layer resistivity, which is the upper part of the plot, 
is qualitatively identical to the drug resistivity. And you would not naively think of that because whatever the mechanism of resistivity of the single layer typically is not what drug would give you. But it seems to suggest that there is an underlying physics uh, in this regime that drives the, the both of them. And uh, as I promised you, we will see that drug uh, resistivity may take a very, very similar form as a single layer resistivity, at least uh, if we believe in the hydrodynamic description and uh, so in that regime. So again, uh, a very strong drug uh, at the high RS uh, numbers in low density samples. And so finally, in the perpendicular field, unfortunately, I was not able to find much data. This is maybe one of the only experiments in weak field before any quantum hole physics. Here, I just simply would like to highlight that once you do a measurement with increased temperature and relatively weaker fields, uh, you see a parabolic magnetodrag resistance, which is temperature dependent. So basically, this uh, plot at the right uh, is plot of uh, magnetic resistance uh, in, uh, normalized by T as a function of B square. And so you basically see that once you increase temperature uh, in this samples from 16 to let's say 30 Kelvin, you see uh, pretty clear uh, B square positive magnetodrag resistance with, uh, with some temperature dependence. So I'd like to make a connection to this experiment as well uh, later on and just to show you what, uh, okay, hydrodynamic theory would, uh, would predict. Okay, so a quick summary. Uh, for the experimental data that we will try to explain that uh, drug in absolute value is stronger in few orders of magnitude uh, in larger S samples. Uh, simple T square dependence does not seem to work in the all uh, measurable accessible temperature domains. Uh, um, so peculiar uh, similarity between magnetodrag resistance uh, and data seems to suggest that there are certain crossovers in temperature regimes and different behavior of the drug. So this is kind of a summary. So what I decided to do is I'd like to give you answer first and then I'll guide you through different pieces of this answer to tell you what physically happens. So let me give you answer first what I think could be uh, an explanation for different temperature dependencies, what this uh, land scale temperature scales are, and then I will flash a few technical details how to get these results. So, so in, the, in the ballistic regime, so I'm talking about very, very clean bilayer. So I'm not discussing uh, disorder effects here. So I think that in lowest temperatures, this is T square. And this T square persists up to the scale TD that we introduced earlier with you. And this scale is roughly speaking V Fermi divided by the distance of the layers. Uh, then it crosses over to linear and temperature dependence which persists all the way to the next scale, which is TC. And TC uh, makes a reference to collision-dominated regime, OK? Collision-dominated regime. In this uh, model that I'm uh, working on, the scale is roughly speaking E Fermi divided by square root of K Fermi D. And I would like, again, to think that K Fermi D is sort of a large parameter, let's say 16, uh, for the sake of this discussion. So these uh, two regimes are collisionless. They can be understood at the level of, let's say, Boltzmann, if you will, um, uh, basically collisionless. What I mean is that intralayer electron electron collisions are not important to describe it, but of course, interlayer electron electron scattering is important. But once you cross over TC, you get into collision dominated regime where intralayer collisions become very much important. And the cross talk between the particle hole continuum and the plasma excitations become very much important. So there is very uh, complicated um, physics of the crossover to T cube. A drug should have a maximum uh, at the plasma peak, uh, which occurs at the uh, scale TH, and this TH is a hydrodynamic regime. And then I, there is a fall off, uh, and this fall off is purely hydrodynamic. So this one over the T behavior is governed by the fluid viscosity, and this regime can be understood from the Navier-Stokes theory. So what I will do uh, in terms of theory analysis, I will first do collisionless because it's simplest and it's probably known to everyone. Then I will jump to hydrodynamic regime and I will talk about the Navier stocks. And then I will tell you a few words at the end how to get the crossover. This is much tougher uh, calculation, much a more technical one. And uh, I just decided to give you a 
flash how to technically do it, but not spend too too much too too much time on it. So these uh, scales from where they come from. So the particle hole continuum T scale is basically a line. So if you go and look at let's say polarization function um, of elect 2D electron gas, we know that imaginary part vanishes at the frequencies above V Fermi Q. This is the line of the particle hole continuum. So basically, if you take typical frequency of excitations to be of the order of temperature and Q to be of the order of one over the distance between the layers, which is a typical momentum transfer, this is your scale TD. Uh, collision dominated regime is a scale when the intra layer mean free path uh, becomes comparable to the distance between the layers. So this is similar scale like the one that I discussed in the viscous magnet resistance section a few uh, minutes ago. And the hydrodynamic regime is actually a plasmon frequency, the typical wave number, compared to the width of the plasmon peak, uh, which is also tau EE. I will explain you just in a second that in the hydrodynamic regime, it's viscosity that gives a uh, lifetime to plasmons. And so to resolve the plasmon resonance, um, you need to think about the intralayer collisions. So it's basically regime and plasmons become hydrodynamic. And this scale I call TH, this is E Fermi divided by the quartic root of K Fermi D. So purely hydrodynamic regime is above TH, crossover regime is between TH T, uh, and TC and collision, a collisionless uh, regime is uh, below that. Just one highlight that um, this fall off doesn't go all the way to down. I mean, once you, so let's say for this strongly correlated regimes, if you go to uh, temperatures above E Fermi, uh, and again, you use this uh, estimates, it's uh, estimates for the semi-quantum semi regime uh, for, uh, Viscosity and thermal conductivity is taken from what uh, Boris Pivak and Steve Kivelson suggested they should look like. Uh, you should expect a rise uh, of, of drug resistance, which is proportional to the power five halves. I should say this is more like a speculative statement at this level because it relies on your belief what this viscosity and thermal conductivities are. And I should say that perhaps surprisingly, but this regime. Uh, we basically know nothing about it for electrons, and it's still very interesting. Uh, of course, above the Fermi, the, the liquid is non degenerate really, but it's still very much quantum uh, and very much strongly correlated. So we don't really know much about transport properties and uh, in this regime, and I think it may be nice and interesting to, uh, to look at this uh, samples with the new perspective and new eye uh, aiming to see some uh, heterodynamic features. So we also looked at the magnetic resistance uh, and uh, we do find positive magnetic resistance as a function of the field. And this positive magnetic resistance is inversely proportional to the fluid viscosity. Uh, similarly to the result of intralayer magnetic resistance that I've showed you. Um, uh, however, the temperature dependence of this uh, term is somewhat different and uh, it differs from the experimental scaling that I highlighted earlier. But um, so even though I could not explain the temperature trend seen in an experiment, uh, I'm just declaring you what the uh, model calculation is. So, and again, so this uh, T cube here is assuming Fermi liquid, uh, Fermi liquid picture. So let me guide you really quickly how to get this uh, result. So collisionless, I'm sure that many of you know and there are many early works that um, I learned from, from Alan McDonald and from Alex Kamen of UL Oreg and uh, Karsten Sandsberg and many, many others who worked on coolant drug in early years uh, and derived uh, okay, diagrammatic formulas and kinetic equation or uh, memory function formalism. There are different, different ways to calculate it. One thing that I would like to highlight, so the generic kind of linear response formula that people often write uh, is okay, square of Coulomb interaction, uh, screened Coulomb, imaginary part of polarization operator. This formula is not the most generic one. Uh, it's still under certain assumptions here. Uh, most general formula should include this triangular vertices here, but this formula has some room of validity uh, in, uh, in, in regimes. One just needs to be careful when to apply it. Uh, one thing that I'd like to highlight is that after the careful reading of old papers, I discovered this work by Smith and uh, Jihau 
And actually they realized that um, uh, this uh, formula that we often use in fact does describe T squared to linear in T crossover. And it's there, you just need to use a very careful expression for the polarization operator, uh, not just expanding over small frequencies, but using this whole uh, Linhardt functions. Um, uh, and when you're very, very close to the threshold, uh, threshold or the par particle hole continuum, the square roots uh, do change the phase space for scattering. And you discover the T squared to linear in T behavior. They've never emphasized it too much. But if you carefully read their paper, I kind of in line reading, I uh, distilled this result from them. So I do not take any credit for discovering this crossover. I think they realized it, but they never highlighted it. So this T square to linear T, uh, to T is just particle hole continuum uh, um, uh, collisionless kinetics. So now I'll jump very quickly to hydro regime. Uh, and this is Navier-Stokes theory. Um, here I write this Navier-Stokes theory um, in slightly um, kind of in different fashion. I include uh, Langevin fluxes uh, in it. Um, it's just a nicer way I think to do a calculation and look at the linearized theory, the fluctuational hydrodynamics uh, was uh, formulated by Landau and Lifshitz. Uh, and so basically uh, by fluctuation dissipation theorem, we can add uh, viscous fluxes and thermal forces and correlate them to the thermal conductivity in fluid viscosity. So this is kind of a combination of volume five and volume 10 of Landau Lifshitz. It's also in their own uh, 1957 paper. So they basically used ideas how to construct uh, fluctuational aerodynamics from the entropy combination of the entropy production and the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So this is just a nicer way to calculate drug uh, problem. You basically write this Navier-Stokes equation for every layer. Uh, you look at the linear response uh, when you impose a aerodynamic flow in one of the layers. So in the theory, you have four variables. So you have entropy, density, pressure, and temperature. And as usual, you take two of them to be independent and two of them to be dependent. It's useful to think and velocity field as well, which is connected to density by the continuity equation. Uh, it is nice to work in density entropy and express temperature fluctuations and pressure fl fluctuations, excuse me. Uh, by uh, an expansion and use general thermodynamic variables, you know, to relate the two. So this is just mechanics of how to do a calculation. Uh, in this system, there are collective modes, and this is what Boris asked me about the whole viscosity. So here we did look at stress tensor, looking at whole viscosity as well, including effects of magnetic field. We do a linear response analysis of this bilayer, um, uh, coupled one. Uh, there is an interesting set of collective modes in the systems. Uh, there are uh, so sound waves, uh, thermomagnetic waves, magnetoplasmons. So I'm uh, highlight a few things that are important for drug and say what different pieces give you. So at the bare level, if you neglect magnetic field and you neglect all of the viscous effects, you neglect everything. So the bilayer consists of uh, two magnetoplasmon modes. So there are two plasmons at zero field. Magnetic field pushes them by B squared term. So we get the uh, magnetoplasmon excitations. Viscosity gives a lifetime to plasmons. So basically imaginary part of the magnetoplasmon, the width of these lines uh, scales with uh, viscosity multiplied by the Q square term, uh, which is a viscous, viscous pole. And also the viscous pole couples to the plasmons, it shifts it. And there are, uh, I'm simplifying here. I'm not writing some pieces which are thermomagnetic and sound waves, they are, they are important in some regimes, but for the drug resistance at maximum, they are, they are not so much important. So everything is dominated by magnetoplasmons. So whole viscosity shifts uh, the dispersion curve of magnetoplasmons uh, upwards and gives uh, a contribution. And there is also a contribution from the whole viscosity to uh, magneto drug uh, resistance. Okay, so that's mechanics of the calculation. I'll probably skip that and just declare the result uh, for the drug viscosity in this hydrodynamic regime, which miraculously has very, very similar structure to intralayer resistance. So there is one term that is uh, temperature divided by thermal conductivity 
in a second theorem, which is related to a full kin kinematic viscosity. So eta here is some of the shear and bulk viscosity of the fluid normalized by the uh, mass, uh, mass density. Okay, so quite remarkable in this regime. It occurs uh, because it's a bilayer in drug, there are some floating functions here, which depends on K Fermi D, but conceptually, physically, it's, it's, it's the same physics. Um, but in this case, kind of what disorder was, a long range disorder was in the single layer case here, the, uh, the distance between the layers in a momentum transfer between them, this mediates uh, the interplay of momentum conserving collisions intralayer and momentum relaxing collisions inter uh, layer. So uh, the crossover very quickly, I'm, I'm see that I'm just uh, abused the time a little bit, but very quickly, uh, the crossover is very tricky. So if you take a naive, uh, this linear in T and drag it all the way to, uh, to match to hydrodynamic formula that I just derived to you, they do not match and plasmons uh, contribution uh, overcomes. Um, so it's bigger. So it basically tells you that when you go into the strongly correlated regime, uh, drug is enhanced. And in order to capture the crossover, uh, uh, it's, it, it, you need much more than uh, hydrodynamics and kin kinetic theory, you need both. So luckily we do have it. Uh, so we, we have um, Boltzmann-Langevin, which is uh, kind of a kinetic version of stochastic kinetic theory with forces. So basically it's, it's kind of hard work uh, to do this um, uh, calculation. We need to retain both hydrodynamic modes in the collision term and relaxing modes um, of the collision operate and work both of them. So basically this crossover TQ piece comes from plasmons uh, talking to particle hole continuum and decay of plasmons into the par particle hole continuum. You could understand that at the kinetic level as well, diagrammatically to look at the plasma decay into the two particle hole uh, excitations. Uh, so that's kind of a mechanism. And this is like a low temperature tail of the plasmons going uh, into the low temperature regime when, when this crosstalk between uh, particle hole and plasmons uh, occurs. So that's kind of difficult work, but it's possible to extract and uh, we can connect uh, two pieces. So we looked at these different mechanisms of magneto drug with Stas and Dima. Uh, so there is viscous flow, um, resistance due to the field dependence of viscosity, magnetoplasma contribution, whole viscosity contribution, thermomagnetic effects contribution. They come with different signs and there is a little competition between them at low field, uh, but viscous contribution kind of overtakes uh, at slightly higher fields. Um, and uh, this is like in my uh, joke, uh, abstract, fake abstract that I send you that there are some predictions that probably could not be observed. So it's probably realistically speaking, very difficult to separate all of this feature, all of these different mechanisms. Um, but okay, so we at least um, in, in this model calculation looked um, at, at different possibilities. So that's that, uh, I'm already five minute, minutes late and I knew that I won't be able to get to some other topics uh, that are out there. So maybe next time when we meet in, in normal circumstances, um, uh, we will enjoy personal discussions and I'm definitely looking forward to meeting you and, and uh, having this pandemic over. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to stay around to take your questions if you have any for me. So thank you so much. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, questions. So you uh, can, can, I, can I ask one or do I need to raise a hand? No, no, I was just about to say, don't raise the hand, just shoot. Okay, okay, thanks. So, Stasha, I mean, feel free to send me to read the original literature. Yes. But uh, do you remember the picture behind this? Uh, semi-quantum regime. Of course, I, I have heard about it only because yes. I know worries. I was preparing uh, for this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, but so just let, let me, so, just let, so, me, let, me, let me finish. Yeah, like, yeah. What, so basically you push the temperature to yes. the point where the thermal wavelengths is shorter than the distance between particles, right? Correct. That's roughly speaking what it is. And then uh, 
quantum statistics does not matter, but uh, single particle quantum mechanics will still matter. Correct. So when you say when you say you know, uh, it's it's correlated. Like what, what do you mean by okay, that? Okay, correlated. Which it just simply means which that correlation? RS is large. This is the only uh, the only statement to correlations. Uh, but yes, so the argument that you just gave for this one over T is more or less what I think Boris used and what uh, earlier. I think Andreev did in the discussions of helium four. <clears throat> right, but uh, so is there uh, is there a reference that they make to to Wigner? So for Andreev, it it was important to have a short range order in helium, right? It's a liquid, correct. but in you know, short scale, correct. it's a solid. Yeah. So basically, they correct. Is so it, is this Wigner crystal here or? Yes, yes, they use the picture of this microemulsion phase as ah, well. That's, that's the same as that same. they have droplets, droplets of Wigner ah. crystal in the Fermi liquid phase, and so that's 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 what it is. So this is uh, this is being recorded, and I, I show my uh, lack of education. God damn it! Yeah, <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> so so it's really it's really about um, phonon modes of uh, Wigner crystal, then, right? So Correct. That, that's yes, what yes, point yes, is. yes, yes. That's and then magneto magneto uh, magneto drug or magneto whatever comes from what exactly? What, which part of that is sensitive to magnetic field? No, this, uh, the magneto drug comes from plasmons in this case, from the plasmon resonance. I, somehow, I, you, I think you mentioned, I showed up basically late because I have to teach on Thursdays at this time, but- uh, ah, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah so but yeah, so the, the that magneto, that was, magneto part drug, drug that came from, from this. the plasmons, yes. Ah, okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So maybe just one small question, Sasha. So uh, the the you know the observation that at the uh, strong correlation limit the uh, inter intra layer resistance is similar to drug, correct? Right. So, so this same, one. So it seems to suggest the same mechanism drives both of them, and so I was trying mm -hmm. to say that mm -hmm. these are these hydrodynamic modes that drive them. So basically, that so how that's. Uh, uh, correlations inside within the layers help to establish the similarity. What what is the how, how that happens? That uh, um, is it just because the correlations somehow um, make uh, the same so process? What I'm thinking maybe that when you go to high RS, basically imagine that these two fluids like locked in together, mm, so it's, it's yeah. easier to. To shake them mm -hmm. up together, so that's that's more or less what I have in mind. Technically speaking, I mean, in a single layer, you can calculate uh, uh, you can calculate force and thus resistance from. Mm -hmm. So you basically can understand resistance in a single layer as a drag on the disorder potential because of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, scattering of this long range disorder uh, correlates um, with the electron electron collisions. So it's, mm -hmm. it's non matisse like description. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. in the drug problem, it's not the disorder that gives you density fluctuations, but thermal, thermal fluctuations. And for that reason, it's very similar, but it has an extra kind of temperature floating because of the Langevin forces that drive you density modes. But other than that, it's same physics. It's just a density, density correlations, either interlayer or interlayer. Yeah, but the similarity is there only for in strong correlation uh, case, right? Not in strong correlation, mm. it's in the hydrodynamic regime. I mean, you could you mm. could think oh, about the okay. weakly correlated as well, but as long as mm. you mm -hmm. uh, take yourself into the hydro regime, uh, it mm -hmm. works in both cases, whether it's RS small or large, it's 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 not important uh, at, at the but, time anymore. But basically, I can see it as a as a manifestation of this uh, non matisse and physics, right? Anti matisse and physics yes. that yes. actually yes. everything yes. is yes. driven together. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Correct. Okay. So I don't, I don't hear any further questions. So yeah, thanks, Alex, again. Thank you, guys, for uh, for showing up for uh, Fool's uh, Day uh, seminar. I was a